I'm very uh, happy to see so many people gathered here together on a Thursday evening and this very auspicious occasion. We're extremely honored and glad to welcome Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, to come and offer some Dhamma teachings uh, here at uh, Amravati Monastery during his uh, stay in the United Kingdom. Uh, to give him a, a little bit of an introduction, he probably doesn't need very much, but uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi was uh, born in uh, the USA, in New York City, and um, he was educated at uh, Columbia University, Brooklyn College, excuse me, and Claremont Graduate University, so I stand corrected on that, and uh, studied philosophy. And uh, I believe you became a novice in the uh, Vietnamese tradition during that time. Uh, and so then went to Sri Lanka and studied with uh, a venerable Ananda Maitreya, who was one of the early patrons and teachers here at Amaravati Monastery when uh, this place first opened in the 1980s. He's been a, a bhikkhu for 46 kasa, 46 reigns. So he is a very venerable and esteemed elder. He is uh, probably without question the most uh, accomplished translator of Pali into English in the current age and is the um, uh, producer of many works. He completed uh, Venerable uh, Nyanamoli's uh, partial translation of the Majima Nikaya, the middle-length discourses. He translated the connected discourses, the Sangyuta Nikaya, the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses, and more recently the Sutta Nipata and its commentaries. He's produced uh, numerous uh, anthologies of the Buddha's teaching, including a, uh, a small book called The Noble Eightfold Path that I spent four years going through paragraph by paragraph with a, a study group in the USA and uh, is a, a, a very uh, compact and wonderful treasure of the, of the Dhamma teachings. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite you to offer some teachings this evening, Bhante. And then, so Venerable will speak for about uh, 45 minutes-ish and then open things up for some questions. If people have questions, please wait for the microphone to reach you and then everyone can hear your questions so that uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi can respond to it with everyone knowing what's been asked. Testing. <laughs> Testing, one, two, three. Is my voice carrying to the back? If you're here in the back, raise your hand so I know. Okay. Okay, let me start with the homage to the Buddha in my style. <laughs> okay. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Okay, first I would like to thank Achan Amaro for inviting me to Amaravati. It just struck me that Amaravati, perhaps it was named auspiciously after the Venerable. <laughs> so he is the appropriate one to take over as the abbot after the retirement of Achan Sumedho. <laughs> yeah, the last time I was here was actually in July of 1999, when this temple had just been completed and the opening ceremony was being held. And so at that time, the monks of Amravati had invited me to come. At that time, I was living in Sri Lanka. And so they invited me to come all the ways to England to participate in the opening ceremony. And so this is the Second time that I'm visiting Amravati after a gap of 20 years. I had planned earlier to speak on one topic this evening, but then after the meal today, I took a little nap. Then when I woke up, I know somehow a voice in my head said, <laughs> speak on the four nutriments. <laughs> and so that will be the subject of my talk. And this is a rather strong topic. So it's not for 
novices or those who are just getting a foothold in the Buddha's teaching. But it's quite, I would say, a very deep, profound, and wide-ranging teaching. But since I got the sort of impulse to speak about it, I will make that the topic. And so the basis for this talk is a statement that comes in the Anguttara Nikaya, the book of the tens, where the Buddha says that there is one topic or one theme that when it's constantly contemplated will lead to nibbida, viraga, and vimuti, that is to disenchantment with all of the conditioned things of the world, to dispassion, the fading out of lust and passion, to liberation, and then it will lead to the breakthrough to the final goal and to the ultimate end of dukkha, of suffering. And then he raises the question, what is that one theme, that one topic to be contemplated and examined? It is the theme that all living beings exist in dependence on nutriment. And so when one reflects on this statement, you know, it's just very concise and seems very simple, but it has such wide-ranging implications. When we consider the whole scale of life, just take even the simplest, like one-celled organisms, like an amoeba or paramecium, that they're in constant interchange with their environment, constantly absorbing nutriment, nutrients out from their environment, then expelling waste into the environment. Waste that will, for perhaps other organisms, become their nutriment. And so starting even from the simplest one-celled organism, all the way through the animal kingdom, you know, if you ever pass a field where you see cows, cows dwelling, and what are the cows doing in that field? All the time, they're grazing, 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 eating the grass, because their bodies depend on the nutrients that they obtain from, from the grass. And while <laughs> they're eating the grass, they're also occasionally farting, <laughs> giving, off, giving off methane gas into the atmosphere, and also depositing the cow dung, their own feces, which becomes the soil, which becomes the fertilizer for the grass, so that more grass will grow to feed more cows in the future. And we come right up to ourselves as human beings, and we also are constantly dependent on food. You know, we've made food a social activity so that we don't really realize explicitly and consciously our dependence on the food and the way food is serving to sustain our bodies. But for most people, well, as monks, we reflect on this theme. But people out in the world, the meal is just a part of their routine life in which they engage almost unconsciously without bringing to conscious awareness the fact that they are eating because their bodies depend on food. Of course, if you question them, they will know this intellectually, but food becomes a kind of regular routine, a social activity in which we go to eat. If it's a family, somebody will prepare the food for the family, and the family will gather in the kitchen or dining hall and then consume the food, chatting about what has taken place during the day. Often one will go out to different kinds of restaurants to eat, to enjoy if you are getting 
I was going to say American food every day or English food every day. You'll go out to maybe a Thai restaurant, Chinese restaurant, Indian restaurant, Ethiopian restaurant, Italian restaurant, in order to enjoy the change of taste. And this reminds me that when I was living in Sri Lanka for many, many years, every day, of course, we used to have Sri Lankan food, Sinhalese food. And so sometimes I even had dreams that I was back in New York City in Chinatown <laughs> and looking up at the variety of Chinese restaurants and pondering, which one should I choose for my meal today? <laughs> Okay, now I'm back in the U.S. living in a Chinese monastery in which we have Chinese food every day. <laughs> but occasionally we have some Sri Lankan dayakas, or lay supporters. Occasionally they will bring the Sri Lankan food to the monastery. And so on the table, they'll be laid out both the regular Chinese dishes prepared at the monastery and the Sri Lankan dishes brought by the Sri Lankan dayakas. And so when I come to the table, my choice is for the Sri Lankan food. <laughs> okay, so food, nutriment, is something on which we all depend. And so we start off with a little baby, baby which is born this size, it begins by drinking its mother's milk. It grows bigger and bigger until it comes to maturity, and then we have the full-size body. And what has made the development of that body possible, the growth of that body, is the ingestion of an adequate supply of food. If the child, the infant, doesn't receive an adequate amount of food, will grow up um, stunted. The body will become short. And that is the condition of many, many children in underdeveloped countries. And when they grow to be adults, the body, the size of the body, is under the normal size. It's stunted. And if one doesn't get enough regular food, then the body becomes excessively emaciated or thin. And if one doesn't receive sufficient food at all, then one can suffer from malnutrition, and this will eventually can terminate in death. In fact, today, in today's world, what I've figured that I've come across is that six million people around the world every year die from hunger, chronic hunger, and hunger-related illnesses. And so this shows the dependence of the body on food, that all living beings, all sentient beings, from the one-celled organism through the more developed animals to human beings, subsist in dependence on nutriment. But the Buddha doesn't confine the word nutriment only to edible food the food that we use to sustain the body. But he uses the word ahara, the Pali word ahara, which we translate as nutriment, in a broader sense. So that the Buddha speaks in the suttas, he speaks of the four kinds of nutriment, chitaro ahara, the four nutriments, which Nyanaponika Terra has translated that as the four nutriments of life. And so the four nutriments are edible food, which is the support for this physical body. And the, the sutta, which speaks about the four nutriments, it says that there are these four nutriments for the support of beings who have come into existence and for the assistance of beings who are seeking 
a new existence. And so this is a, quite an interesting statement that the four nutriments support beings who have already come into existence, that is, ourselves and all other living beings that we know about or that we can see. But they also assist the coming into being of those, we call them beings, who have passed away from a previous existence and are now in what we would call the intermediate state, where they are being directed towards a new existence, being directed towards a rebirth into a new, concrete, embodied form of existence, but they have not yet actually achieved that embodied existence. They're still in the seeking stage, but somehow these four nutriments support them, sustain them, assist them. Okay, so the four nutriments, we have the edible food, which is the support for this physical body. But then the second nutriment is what the Buddha calls in Pali, pasa, which means contact. And contact, it's a somewhat metaphorical term. Originally, pasa means the physical touch But the Buddha uses it to signify the mental touch. That is the touch of the mind with its object. And so in other suttas, the Buddha defines contact. He says that what is contact? It is the coming together of three things. The coming together of an object, a sense faculty, and consciousness. So the encounter of these three things, the meeting of these three things, is what we call contact. And the way I understand this, we speak about three things involved in contact. And the way I understand this is that the sense faculty functions as a door So it's a door through which we could say that consciousness goes out that door in order to meet the object. Or from the other angle, we could say it's the door through which the object comes in to the inner field of experience to be available to consciousness. And so when consciousness encounters the object, through the door, that event of encounter is what is called pasa, or contact. And contact is the second of the four kinds of nutriments. And what is it the nutriment for? Specifically, or in the narrow sense, it is the nutriment for feeling. And we see this in the formula of dependent origination, pasa pachaya vedana, that it's conditioned by contact, that there is feel, feeling. And contacts can be of different kinds. So it's said that there's contact which is to be experienced as pleasant, contact that's to be experienced as painful, and contact that's to be experienced as neither painful nor pleasant. And so each of these three kinds of contacts is the nutriment or condition for its corresponding feeling. So in dependence on a contact to be experienced as pleasant, a pleasant feeling arises. In dependence on a contact to be experienced as painful, a painful feeling will arise and dependent on a contact to be experienced as neither painful nor pleasant, then a feeling arises that's not pleasant, not painful. We could call that neutral feeling, indifferent feeling.
Okay, even though contact is said to be the strong, the nutriment or the strong condition for feeling, but contact is also the condition for every other aspect of the mental life. All of our mental functions occur in dependence on contact. And so there are some suttas which speak about how contact is also the condition for, for perception. So from one angle, the contact has a particular felt tone to it. Maybe we can call this the affective tone. That's the tone of being pleasant, painful, or neutral. But the contact also introduces to consciousness, it introduces the sense datum. And so in that way, contact becomes the condition for sanya, perception. So if it's a contact occurring through the eye, then we will perceive visible forms through the eye. If it's a contact occurring through the ear, then we perceive sounds through the ear. And so for the other senses. And so contact is the necessary condition for all the other mental functions. But the two which are most important here are feeling and perception. Because feeling, we could say, is that particular quality that determines the nature of our affective life, the felt tone of our experience. And perception, or sanya, is the domain of our ideation, the way we see things, the way we interpret the world to ourselves. So people, based on different contexts, will have different ways of seeing interpreting, understanding the world around them. And all of that is nourished, dependent upon contact. Okay, then we come to the third nutriment, and this is the nutriment called mano sanchetana. So mano is mind, and sanchetana is volition. I don't actually know why... Mano is necessary here, since chaitana is always a mental activity. In any case, this is what we translate as mental volition. That is, the volitional activity of the mind. Our intentions, our choices, our decisions, the way we respond to the feelings that come in, to the perceptions that we that we make to the ideas that we form. So those responses become a volitions, and the volitions are those particular activities of the mind that generate karma. So that is why mental volition plays such an important, such a decisive role in our inner lives. Because it's through our vol let us say that our actions, the actions of body, speech, and mind that create karma, begin with our volitions. Sometimes the volition can come up very gently, very softly, very delicately, in which case it might become just a sort of blip on the mental screen, then passes away. But if we don't attend mindfully to these volitions and recognize them as they occur, then those volitions can gain momentum. And when they gain a certain degree of momentum, then they can turn into strong mental decisions, choices, preferences, discriminations of the mind. And then moving beyond that stage where they're locked up internally, they can manifest in actions of body and actions of speech. And so it's those actions of mind, of body, speech, and mind that generate the karma. 
and that accumulate the karma. And the generation of karma begins with the acts, those little, almost imperceptible acts of mental volition. And so it's said that volition, mental volition, how is it a nutriment? It's said to be a nutri- the nutriment for existence or re- renewed existence in any of the three realms of existence. So Buddha's cosmology speaks about three basic realms of existence. The desire realm, which includes the hell realms, the realm of the hungry ghosts or afflicted spirits, the animal realm, the human realm, and the lower heavenly realms. Then there's the form realm or the realm of subtle matter, which is the realm of existence that corresponds to the jhanic attainments. And then above the form realm is the arupa dhatu, the formless or immaterial realm of existence. And so we have these three realms of existence. And what propels living beings into these different realms of existence and what drives them on from one realm to another is their karma. So if one generates unwholesome karma and that karma becomes strong and habitual, then it becomes the nutriment for renewed existence, not in the heavenly realms, (laughs) not in the human realm, but down into one or another of the apaya, the miserable or unfortunate realms. If one generates meritorious or wholesome karma below the jhanic level, so the acts of generosity, giving, through faith, practices of faith and devotion, observing the silas or precepts, practicing, we call the more discursive types of meditation, like reflection on the, the, the recollection of the three jewels, the Brahma Viharas, below the jhanic level, that becomes the nutriment for renewed existence back into the human realm or into the lower heavenly realms. If one attains the jhanas, that become, those become the nutriments for rebirth into the form realm. And if one attains and masters the formless arupa attainments, that becomes the nutriment for rebirth into the formless realms of existence. And if one generates what's called, well, I'll come to this later, Okay, so in this way, our mental volition is what generates, what creates the karma, and that karma then becomes the nutriment bringing about renewed existence into one or another of the three realms of existence, into the realm that corresponds to the nature of that karma. And so we could say that all this diversity of sentient existence is due to our volitions, our intentions. And there's an inter- a very interesting sutta, the Sangyuta Nikaya. I think it's the Kanda Sangyuta, where the Buddha asked the monks whether they are aware of the diversity of the animal realm. And the monks say, of course, we've seen so many different kinds of animals. Then the Buddha says, that diversity of the animal realm is brought about by the mind, by the diversity in our volitions. And so when we look at all of the different birds, all the different kinds of mammals, all the different kinds of, what are other kinds of animals? amphibians, reptiles, and so on. You know, it seems so hard to believe, but if we accept the statement of the Buddha, it seems to be the case. All of those differences amongst all of these living beings, 
are just reflections of the diversity in volitions that have been created by living beings, the diversity that has brought them to rebirth into those different animal realms. Okay, so in this way, mental volition is a nutriment, the nutriment for existence in any of the different realms of being, realms of existence. Okay, the fourth nutriment is consciousness. And this is somewhat difficult to understand, but it's said that conscious, the Buddha says that consciousness is the nutriment for nama rupa, which sometimes literally would be translated name and form, or mentality, materiality. And so this indicates that this complex of body and the functions of the mind depend for their existence, for their operation, upon consciousness. And in my interpretation, this can be understood in two ways, both pertaining to our existence throughout life and to the process of rebirth. First, taking what occurs during the course of our life, something which is maybe easier to perceive. We could say that this functioning of the body and the mind depends on the presence of consciousness. Like if consciousness is not present and it doesn't mean when I go to sleep into a deep dreamless sleep, because even according to Buddhism, a deep dreamless sleep, conscious, even though we're not aware, but consciousness is still functioning at some level. What we mean is when consciousness completely disappears or leaves the body at death. Okay, in that case, what we call the body becomes not a rupa, not a functioning body, or not a kaya but it just is a corpse. So for this body to be functioning as a body, for the eye to be able to see, the ear to be able to hear, for the blood to circulate, for the cells to be absorbing nutrients and dispelling waste, for all of that to occur, consciousness is necessary. And then consciousness is also the essential condition for the other mental factors, for feeling, perception, volition, and all the other mental mental functions recognized in the Buddha's texts. All of those depend on the existence of consciousness. And so throughout life, we have this relationship of mutual dependence between nama rupa, mentality, materiality, and consciousness. So, nama rupa becomes a functioning psychophysical organism because consciousness is present within that physical, psychophysical organism. And consciousness, in turn, depends upon the psychophysical organism. If something happens to the body, say, we're driving down a road and some drunk driver comes speeding down, collides with our car, this body gets damaged to the point that it can no longer sustain life, consciousness leaves. So consciousness depends upon a functioning physical organism and the other mental factors. And so there's this relationship of mutual support between the two throughout the course of life. Venerable Sariputta in a sutta, he compares this to two stacks of hay mutually supporting each other. So if you pull away the stack of hay on the right side, the left-hand stack of hay collapses. If you pull away the left-hand stack of hay, the right-hand stack collapses. And so if Namarupa is no longer able to support consciousness, Consciousness departs. If consciousness departs, 
nama rupa no longer functions. So that is the way consciousness is a nutriment in the course of life, but consciousness also becomes the nutriment, the essential nutriment in maintaining the process of renewed existence. Because what happens at death is that the physical body can no longer function as a physical support for the stream of consciousness. Consciousness depends on this physical body, but when this physical body, when the life force expires, consciousness can no longer function on the basis of this body. But consciousness doesn't come to an end with the death of the body, but it moves on, in a sense, metaphorically, seeking a new existence. And then when it finds the right conditions, the right parents, the right environment, the right social, economic conditions, and so forth, then consciousness, again metaphorically, descends into the mother's womb and connects with the fertilized egg. And that that turns that fertilized egg into a living organism, beginning the process of conception and then the newly fertilized embryo then will gradually grow and develop to become the living organism. And so that process of embryonic and fetal development requires the arrival of consciousness. So in this way, consciousness is the nutriment for the arising of nama rupa, name and form, mentality, materiality, in a new existence, the condition for that nama rupa that will begin the process of development that will culminate in a new living being emerging from the egg, from the womb, or whatever. Okay, so this takes us through the four nutriments of life. But now the Buddha says that one should practice for disenchantment with these four nutriments and for dispassion towards them. And it is through disenchantment and dispassion that one becomes liberated from the four nutriments of life and that one reaches the ultimate goal, dukkha santang, the end of dukkha. So how does one practice in regard to the four nutriments? And so there are different modes of practice in regard to each of these nutriments. And I could just just briefly touch on these here. Okay, first, in regard to edible food, the first nutriment, the Buddha has you know, laid down certain guidelines for practice can say grow it going from the grosser level to the subtle level of practice. So at the grossest, most obvious level, for our monastics, the Buddha has laid certain laid down a certain reflection that we're supposed to turn over in the mind before we start each meal. Because when we come into the dining hall, we see all of the different varieties of food laid out prepared with much dedication, devotion, love, great variety of flavors. (laughs) And so immediately the mind lights up, wow, how wonderful this will be. This must be delicious. Wow, I never saw that before. Let me try a little bit of this. (laughs) And oh, she brought that. Oh, I haven't had that in a long time. Let me just scoop one spoon after another. (laughs) There's plenty of food, so the other monks and nuns, they'll have enough to eat. I'll take that all for myself. (laughs) Okay, so how does one control that immediate, spontaneous response of craving for the delicious food? So the Buddha lays out the reflection that wisely reflecting, I take this food, 
So not for fun, not for infatuation with the taste, not to become beautiful and handsome, but only for the support and maintenance of this body, for protecting it from harm, for living the brahmacharya, the holy life. So that's a reflection that we use as monastics. And also lay people can also take that reflection and use that. Or else another way, maybe more appropriate for the household life, when taking the food, one reflects that I use this food to abstain from all evil, to cultivate the good, and to purify my mind. So whichever way, but but if one makes the appropriate reflection, then when one takes the food, one will be aware of the need to curtail and restrain the craving for the delicious variety of tastes. And one uses the food to maintain the health of the body. And also perhaps in doing this reflection, one will also know that one should prepare healthy and nutritious food, not food which is just delicious, but is harmful to the body. Because so many people in the West suffer from these, they call these non-communicable diseases that are due to unwise intake of food, particularly a lot of sweets, a lot of fatty foods, a lot of food with artificial flavors and colors and so forth. Okay, so coming to a subtler level, you know, after doing the reflection on the use of food, one practices while taking the food restraint of the senses. And the way one restrains the senses in regard to taste, the way that I found most effective is when tasting, one just notes the taste. And then when liking arises, liking for particular flavors, one just notes liking this, liking that. And so in this way, one can't, of course, prevent the liking for certain preferred foods from arising. But when one notes the liking, then one prevents that liking from gaining the upper hand and becoming the driving force of the mind. But one just notes it as a mental event and lets it go. Another way, and this is a kind of method which has been taught in the Mahasi system of meditation, and it's rather difficult to do under normal conditions, but I found that one could do it under retreat conditions, is to be mindful of every phase in the act of eating. So when one is going to take, say, a spoon of food, one is mindful taking the spoon when lifting the spoon to the mouth, aware of lifting, lifting. (laughs) When putting the food into the mouth, aware of putting the food in. When chewing, aware of each, not simply of chewing, chewing, but of each chew of the food. (laughs) Then when tasting, aware of tasting. When intending to swallow, aware of intending to swallow. When swallowing, aware of swallowing. (laughs) And when one becomes aware of each phase, one starts to get tired of eating after about seven minutes. <laughs> okay, so this is a way to practice with the edible nutriment, a way to help to stem the craving that naturally arises in regard to delicious food and to develop a certain degree of detachment from the food. And as one practices in this way, especially attentive to the process of eating, the process of swallowing and so forth, a certain nibida can arise to the act of eating. A certain disengagement or dis disenchantment towards the act of eating, which when it gains momentum can turn into dispassion and lead to liberation. Okay, in regard to the nutriment of contact, the Buddha has taught the practice of Vedananupasana, 
the contemplation of feeling, and that has been included within the four foundations of mindfulness. And so it's extremely difficult to notice the contact when it takes place, because the contact is a very, very subtle event. I think when one becomes, what I've found in experience is like when doing a long-term retreat, after maybe a couple of weeks, one could start noticing and being able to distinguish what is the contact. But the easier approach is not to go for the contact itself, but for the consequence, the effect of the contact. And that effect is the feeling. And so feeling, in turn, becomes a, if it's left unchecked, becomes a strong condition for craving. So we see this in the dependent origination, pasa pachaya vedana, vedana pachaya tanha, that feeling is conditioned by contact and conditioned by feeling, craving arises. So the way to break that link, that connection between feeling and craving, is to pay mindful attention to the feelings themselves as they arise. And so when one experiences a pleasant feeling, then one observes a pleasant feeling, a pleasant feeling, that's a pleasant feeling. And so one doesn't elaborate upon the pleasant feeling, mentally proliferate upon it, and then build up one's craving and attachment on the basis of that pleasant feeling. Then when experiencing a painful feeling, again, one notes it as a painful painful feeling. And then one doesn't build up mental stories on top of that painful physical feeling. And so if one doesn't apply mindful awareness when one is undergoing some painful bodily feeling, One thinks, why is this happening to me? How unlucky I am. Oh, I have such bad karma from past lives. Oh, everybody else is so happy and successful, but I have to endure this painful, um, painful, acute, disabling feeling. Okay, so instead of building up these mental stories, so when one experiences painful feeling, then one just attends to the painful feeling as pain, 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 and turns it into the pain even into, especially when doing the sitting meditation, turning it into an object of observation and just noting the rising and passing away of painful feeling. And then the neutral feeling, feeling which is neither painful nor pleasant, that can escape the attention and can become even a subtle breathing ground for attachment. So the advice the Buddha gives is to attend even to that neutral feeling, (coughs) simply observing it. simply observing it as neutral feeling. And in that way, that neutral feeling will be known. One will be able to see into that neutral feeling, and so it will not become an object of a subtle attachment to that quiescent piece of the neutral feeling. Okay, then there's actually a rather stronger sort of more potent remedy for developing this detachment from feeling, this disengagement from feeling. And I found this in a little sutta in the Itti Vutaka. It's a sutta where the Buddha says, pleasant feeling should be seen as painful. Painful feeling should be seen as a dart and neutral feeling should be seen as impermanent. 
So here the Buddha is not saying be mindful of pleasant feeling as pleasant, but see pleasant feeling as painful. (laughs) So why is pleasant feeling painful? The sutta doesn't say why, but I think if one looks into the experience of pleasant feeling, when we're undergoing that pleasant feeling, when we'll see that a kind of subtle grasping takes place to that pleasant feeling. One wants the pleasant feeling and the object that is causing that pleasant feeling. One wants that feeling and the object to last, to endure. And so there's, underlying the pleasant feeling, there's this anxious grasping of it, holding to it, wanting it to last. And that grasping will be accompanied by a very subtle, painful feeling. So there's a very rapid alternation of the pleasant, the immediate ground-level pleasant feeling, and built on that, the painful feeling of the grasping. And then when the pleasant feeling or the object that causes the pleasant feeling disappears or stops or gets removed, then there comes the feeling of disappointment, which is a painful feeling. So that's how pleasant feeling should be seen as painful. And painful feeling should be seen as a dart. I think that's obvious, but one sees a painful feeling is like a dart which has pierced the body. And neutral feeling should be seen as impermanent because if one doesn't see the neutral feeling as impermanent, again, the attachment will latch onto it. But when one sees it as impermanent, then one can observe it without attaching to it. Okay, so these are some ways of sort of detaching oneself from the nutriment of contact by way of its, the way one responds to its effect, that effect being feeling. <clears throat> okay, then comes mental volition. And here what I would say is that to detach from mental volition, one sh- should proceed in a graduated way And so this is my understanding that one doesn't immediately start to try to detach from mental volition or from the karmic activities, but rather what one does is to generate what I call the joy in the wholesome by generating wholesome, meritorious, volitional activities which suffuse the mind with happiness and help to weaken the power of the unwholesome over the mind. And so what are particularly effective for generating the joy in the wholesome are the practices that the Buddha lays down as the basis for merit, like practicing generosity. So when one gives and then one reflects back on one's generosity, One feels a kind of lightness in the heart, a joy in the heart. When one undertakes the five beautiful precepts and then reflects on how wonderful and uplifting and pure these precepts are, then there arises the joy in the heart. When one practices certain meditations which are especially effective in generating that joy in the wholesome, particularly what I found, the recollection of the three jewels, recollection of the Buddha, Dharma Sangha, and the meditation or development of loving kindness. So in this way, one is still generating karmic formations. One is not going immediately to disengagement, disenchantment, um, dispassion, liberation. But one is generating beautiful, wholesome volitions which will uplift the mind and push to the sidelines the unwholesome mental tendencies, the kilesas, the defilements, and all of the 
thoughts and emotions and activities generated by the defilements in that open space of joy in the wholesome will then serve as a foundation for generating insight into the impermanent and conditioned nature even of those wholesome, wholesome volitional activities. And in that way, pave the way for disenchantment, dispassion, liberation. Okay, the fourth nutriment is the nutriment of consciousness. And this is extremely difficult to deal with in its own right, because consciousness is very, very subtle. And so the way, perhaps, that's most effective for dealing with consciousness would be through the practice of cheat anupasana, the contemplation of mind taught in the Satipatthana Sutta. So in that method, one is really actually not directly seeing the consciousness itself, but one is be learning how to identify states of consciousness in terms of the mental factors that are associated with that consciousness. So at the simplest level is the level of whether the mind is associated with greed, with hatred, with delusion, or whether the mind is detached from greed, from hatred, delusion. But another method that I found for contemplating the mind I don't know whether I've gotten this from somebody else or whether it just occurred to me, (laughs) is to observe the mind itself and use the word mind as a tool, a focusing tool, for observing the mind. (laughs) And so, maybe after establishing a certain degree of calmness and mindfulness through observation of the body, some bodily object, then one could turn to the mind and just give rise to the word mind and keep on repeating it, not mechanically, like mind, 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 but keep on letting the word mind rise in the mind and you observe the word mind and while you're observing the word mind, it's cueing you to look at the mind. And every once in a while, one will see that the word mind has disappeared (laughs) and the focus on the mind has disappeared and the mind is drifting. So when the mind is drifting, then one just notes the mind drifting and then brings the mind back to the mind using the word mind as the focusing device for observing the mind. And as one does this, then one can begin to tune in to the functioning of the mind at increasingly subtler levels. Okay, so we've covered in this talk, we've spoken about the contemplation or of the four nutriments of life, the nutriment of edible food from which one gains disen- disenchantment, disengagement, through reflecting on the use of food and then being exercising restraint over the senses, being mindful of the act of eating, the nutriment of contact through which one gains disengagement indirectly through contemplation of feeling, the nutriment of mental volition through which one gains gradual disengagement through generating the joy of the wholesome and then contemplating the conditioned and impermanent nature even of those wholesome volitions and then the nutriment of consciousness through which one gains disengagement by contemplating the mind and then seeing into the impermanent nature of mental events. So maybe this will cover the groundwork of these four nutriments. And so now will be time maybe to open the floor to questions. And the questions can be maybe either on this talk itself. Do they have to be on this talk or could they be on other topics? Okay. So please feel welcome to ask.
I see a hand in the back. Some, actually, I see now. I saw two hands. Hi. <laughs> thank thank you very much uh, for your for your talk. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Okay. The, the first question goes back to the nutriment. Yeah. Of um, of the body, yeah. and and the taste, yeah. and uh, what you talked about was cultivating um, disenchanted, yeah. um, a sort of sense perception, it, as as it were, like neither liking nor dislike, or if yeah. you do, a like arises, it's disconnected. Yeah. I was wondering whether or not, because food sustains consciousness, we could have appreciative, disenchanted. Um, a, uh, yeah, contact. So, although you neither like or dislike, you can appreciate sustaining consciousness, uh, as it were. Say that again. I'm not quite sure that I caught. Um, okay, so appreciative, sustaining consciousness. Uh, yeah. So you know, uh, the nutriments are about uh, the body nutriment leads to. Um, Body nutriment leads to sustaining consciousness ultimately. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's actually the nutriment is the edible food. The, the edible that food. That is what sustains yeah. the body. Th that's what sustains the body. Yeah, but it also it does in a sense indirectly sustain in consciousness. consciousness because, exactly. Because, yes. Yeah. 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 So in that sense, we have. Is, would it? Is it wise to? Is it wise to produce? You know, as you it, sense data goes in, and you have a formation of either like or dislike. Yeah. Um, and then we cultivate disenchantment with that sense. Yes. I, I believe, or it may be wise, to also um, have a sense of appreciation, even though you're, yeah. you're, you're not, uh, you're, even though you're disenchanted. It could be yeah. appreciative disenchantment. Yeah. to the nutriment of, of the, for the body. I see. You mean to be appreciative of the food for its function of sustaining the body. Is that what you mean? Yes, whilst, whilst, or, um, whilst uh, Why? experiencing the like or dislike that you're disenchanted with. Yeah, I think, I mean, certainly one can appreciate the food itself for its function of sustaining the body and keeping the body alive. Yeah. And one could appreciate the, well, this is for, for the monastics, the diakas, for providing the food. And actually, not actually, it shouldn't be only confined to monastics. Mm. Um, there's a reflection that's used in the Chinese Mahayana tradition that one reflects that saying like hundreds of people, of beings are responsible for providing mm. me with this food. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, I yeah. find that helpful myself. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the other question is about access to nutriment yeah. for the mind. So, for example, this Dharma talk for me yeah. is nutriment for my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because um, your, the use of mind as a sort of object of meditation yeah. um, to, to sort of dissolve the concept. I've done similar a few years ago. I used the word concept, actually, yeah. because there's something for me about the concept of concept where it's conceiving and uh, letting go. There's a sort of, this is just a concept, was actually <laughs> what yeah. I found helpful. Um, so for me, nutriment for the mind is yeah. about access to mental formations that can help facilitate yeah, our yeah. development as beings. Yeah, yeah. And my question is about whether or not the structure of um, monastic life with the monks and the nuns, although internally can produce enlightened beings and perhaps potentially faster in some cases yeah. for nuns living a monastic life than monks because of their relationship to experience, when you have people at point of entry, are they potentially put off by that structure and therefore have less access to, uh, to, 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 to the teaching? So, what? 
maybe say that point again. Okay. When you have people at point of entry. At point of entry. Okay, so, sorry. So my background, sorry, my background, the reason this comes up is my background as a person is that I'm from FE originally, and I worked in retention and development. So my mental formations are all about supporting the development of people, yeah. although there have been things in my life where I haven't, and I've been a bit yeah. stupid, uh, to say the least. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, so my concern is if I met one of my students who often would be reluctant to engage in a program of development, and I can see, in my view, that Dharma is like a program of yeah. development, in a sense. Um, I, those people who may perceive nuns not having such a good life, even though internally the, that might have really fantastic seeds for... For, for development, they, they may not go into monastic life because they're put off by seeing perhaps nuns as having a less, mm -hmm. um, quite, less, uh, less access to the Dharma than, than monks, even though they don't necessarily. Yeah. Do, do you understand my question? I, I understand that. I have to oh. say that I agree that that seems to be a problem with much, much of traditional Buddhism. Okay. Right. Maybe a problem that has to be corrected in our modern society. Uh, yeah, that's what I was... Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> that's it. Sorry, that's it. That's my question. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think yeah, in places in the West, they're trying to correct that problem that one finds in many of the traditional Buddhist countries. And somebody with... Yeah, in this row, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the <clears throat> depth and clarity of your presentation this evening. Um, very inspiring. Uh, my question really relates to the state of the world as it is at the moment and the concerns with the environment yeah, and with yeah, the yeah. nurturing of life yeah, yeah, yeah. and the extinction that we're all facing. Yes. Yeah. And I would really be very grateful for some kind of uh, for your reflections on that theme because I know there's a lot of fear yeah. A lot of anxiety, yeah. and it permeates a lot of life, a lot of yeah. people's lives. And uh, I think it'd be nice to hear uh, your views and reflections on that. So thank yeah. you I actually have pretty strong views on this. <laughs> that I mean, human civilization and even all higher forms of life are in very grave danger because of the change of the climate and also the... <clears throat> way in which we exp we are discharging so many toxic substances into the natural environment, which are extinguishing, f pushing to extinction many forms of life, and we don't know which forms of life we're extinguishing form vital links within this vast web of life. But even apart from that, the change to the climate, it's just almost every day, every week, I'm reading new reports about that the changes are taking place much faster than scientists had predicted, sometimes like seven times faster. I just, earlier this afternoon, I read something. The melting of the ice sheets in Greenland, they're melting much, much faster than scientists had predicted. And we're, re we're reaching a point, you know, that there are these so many certain feedback loops or tipping points that when we reach them, they could ignite these feedback loops which will accelerate the process of climate change to the point where, you know, now they're predicting at a current rate, I think we've already gone up to about one degree Celsius um, above pre-industrial levels, and we're moving pretty rapidly towards 1.5 degrees once we go above that, it's going to set off unforeseeable feedback loops that will just accelerate the process to the point where climate change just becomes utterly irreversible. So the big question is, like, what can be done about this? And I have to say, it's the real villain in the piece, or at least one of the major villains, is my country. <laughs> the United States, we've put into power a president and 
Well, the Senate, the Congress now is in the hands of the Democrats who have some awareness of the reality of climate change. But the big obstacles, we have the president who's trying to open up lands to extraction, to open up new offshore drilling, the Arctic refuge to exploration for fossil fuels, with the idea that it doesn't matter what we do, that there are no consequences we'll have to face. So I think the essential step is to, we have to elect representatives and presidents and national leaders in every country who are aware of the gravity of the crisis that we're facing and are ready to do, to take the action that's necessary to, you know, to stem this tide and to reverse the crisis. I'm just thinking in terms of personal practice, <clears throat> in terms of one's meditative inquiry into the fear that it gives rise to, yeah. um, and the fact that there's something so final about the danger that we're in. Something so... So final. Final, yeah. Yeah. And the teachings... Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's all I really want to say. Well, I think if... If one reflects meditatively upon the gravity of the crisis and, as you say, the possible finality of it, that should serve as a strong motivation for taking action. And meditating deeply. Yeah. I see a hand back there. Uh, Bunty, uh, I looked you up on the internet and uh, it said you like to empower women, which I thought was really nice. So my question will be about that. The schools of Buddhism now, I believe, come from one source that broke into the school, different schools, different groups of yeah. and traditions. So therefore... Um, the nuns in the Mahayana tradition come from the original pond. Come from the original pond, as it were, the original source. Their yeah, yeah. lineage come, comes from the original source. It's yeah. not a separate, like, planet. They came from the, the original yeah. school. Yeah. Um, the, one of the um, uh, objections to the um, bhikkhuni ordination is that there's not enough nuns. Yeah. Okay, so, and some people don't seem to want to accept the Mahayana nuns, but they come from that source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Buddha, before he made any rules on ordination, yeah. there were so many objections, but then Ananda said, you know, can these people become enlightened? And he said, well, okay, you got me there, but there's going to have to be <laughs> rules because we've got this sort of life of Brian situation, we've got all the wives and everything, so we're going to have to get a little bit, yeah. You know, there's going to have to be some rules, yeah. which is fair enough. But to deny the women the right to create a fourfold sangha yeah. because you haven't got the nuns, when you do have that source, yeah. I wondered if you had any feelings or comments on that. I know it's a tricky one, but yeah. it said on the internet that you empower women, you know, so I've come to you. Yeah. Yeah, this gets into a rather complex issue. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm going to get into trouble if I'm trying to answer that. <laughs> Be brave. <laughs> okay, I spoke about that, that particular issue at a conference in Hamburg on revival of bhikkhuni ordination in 2007. Okay, this was my thought. Okay, there are objections to the revival of the bhikkhuni order on two, two grounds. Okay, one is that there is no order of bhikkhunis. Okay, the way that ordination procedure for bhikkhunis developed <laughs> over time 
in during the, the Buddha's life, first he gave permission to the bhikkhus to ordain the bhikkhunis, because at that time there weren't any bhikkhunis, only Mahapajapati Gotami. So he said that I allow you monks to ordain women as bhikkhunis. Okay, then at a certain time in the development of the bhikkhuni sangha, he instituted a dual sangha, a dual ordination. That's the ordination by both branches of the sangha. So now the bhikkhunis perform the initial ordination, and then the candidates are ordained first by the bhikkhunis, and then they go to the bhikkhu sangha, and they get a confirming ordination from the bhikkhuni sangha. So that becomes the dual sangha ordination. Okay, at a certain point in the history of Theravada Buddhism in Sri Lanka, probably the 11th century, perhaps because of the invasions from South India, the Bhikkhuni Sangha died out. And at this point, Theravada Buddhism had not yet spread to Thailand or Burma, or perhaps it was present in small pockets in those regions, but not yet flourishing, and without a Bhikkhuni Sangha. And so the decision the monks came to is that now the bhikkhuni sangha has died out, and so the bhikkhuni ordination can't be revived. Okay, now, <clears throat> as you point out, early Buddhism divided into a number of schools, which spread out from the original sangha and migrated to different parts of northern India or greater India. So the, what we call now the Theravada school migrated from India southward to Sri Lanka and then eventually from Sri Lanka to Thailand, Myanmar. <clears throat> Another branch of the early Sangha migrated northwards to the area that now corresponds to Pakistan and eastern Afghanistan. At that time it was called Gandhara. And the school that flourished in that region is called the Dharma Guptaka school. They have a vinaya, which is very, very similar to the Theravadan vinaya, differing maybe in a few little respects. And um, yeah, the sutta collection, again, very similar to that of the Theravada tradition. So the Dharma Guptakas were not a Mahayana school, but they were school following the early teaching but just based on a slightly different vinaya and recension of the suttas. Okay, it's that school that migrated, or that brought its vinaya tradition to China. At a certain point, there were a number of vinaya schools flourishing in China, not the Theravada school, which didn't reach China, but a number of other schools, until at a certain point, to have uniformity, the emperor declared the Dharma Guptaka school will become the single authoritative and authorized Vinaya system for Chinese monastics. So in terms of the doctrines and teachings that they were studying, the Chinese monastics were following Mahayana Buddhism, but the Vinaya system that they were following was that derived from this other early school, the Dharma Guptaka. <clears throat> Initially, the nuns were being ordained in China solely by the bhikkhus, but at a certain point, the bhikkhus, the nuns, wanted to receive the dual sangha ordination, and they were aware that there was a bhikkhuni sangha in Sri Lanka. And so they sent to Sri Lanka for a contingent of bhikkhunis who came to China and then conferred the bhikkhuni ordination, probably following the Theravada Vinaya system, but still the dominant system of Vinaya was the Dharma Guptaka school. Okay, so that is the historical basis. And now in modern times, when there has been the desire of number of women to receive bhikkhuni ordination, like two arguments have been presented for re-establishing the bhikkhuni sangha. One argument to overcome the objection that you need a dual sangha ordination is to use nuns, bhikkhunis from either Taiwan, 
mainland China or Korea to represent the bhikkhuni sangha and then have Theravada bhikkhus confer the, the, the confirming ordination on the women who receive their initial ordination through the, the Chinese or Korean bhikkhuni sangha. And that was the procedure that was used in 1998 in India at Bodh Gaya <coughs> at an ordination convened by a Taiwanese organization called Folk Kuan Shan, the Buddha's Light International. And so at that ordination, women who wanted the Theravada ordination were ordained first by the two sanghas, the Chinese or Taiwanese bhikkhuni sangha, and then by a mixed bhikkhu sangha with monks, both Theravada and Chinese and maybe Tibetan monks participating. But then the objection that would have been faced when those nuns, if they went back to Sri Lanka, would have been, ah, you received a Mahayana ordination. <laughs> and so it would have been difficult for people to understand that this was not a Mahayana ordination, but an ordination following a different Vinaya tradition coming from the early period. So what the Sri Lankan monks then did with the women who had received the dual Sangha ordination is that they brought them to Sanath, to Isipatana. And then they performed a single ordination, a single Sangha ordination according to the Theravada tradition, based on the Pali Vinaya, <clears throat> on the premise that when the Buddha said, I allow you monks to ordain bhikkhunis, he didn't intend to cancel that as a valid ordination procedure. And so the women then received the bhikkhuni ordination under the bhikkhu, the Theravada bhikkhu sangha, as a single sangha ordination. So in this way, they had the dual Sangha ordination from the Chinese, from the Chinese Sangha, and then the Theravada Vinaya ordination, following the Theravada Vinaya from the Sri Lankan bhikkhus in Isipatana. And then afterwards, the bhikkhunis who were ordained, they, they went back to Sri Lanka, and over several periods, they relied on nuns from Taiwan to serve as the bhikkhuni contingent in conferring the ordination until at a certain point some of the Sri Lankan bhikkhunis achieved enough seniority to function as the preceptor in ordinations conducted according to the exclusively according to the Pali system. And so that is the procedure that has gone on in Sri Lanka and now in some of the Western countries. So that perhaps will answer your question. Thank you. Okay, so let us take some questions here. I see a, uh, I see a hand in this front row, front column. Thank you so much, Ante. It's, it's a great honor to have you here. I've got a question about the contact, the, yeah. the sparse and uh, cultivating uh, detachment or disenchantment towards sparse. Uh, sparse. Uh, so the, the, the second um, nutriment is the contact, yeah. as, as I heard. And the, the way to cultivate uh, disenchantment towards is by cultivating or uh, cultivate, I suppose cultivating might be the right word. Uh, wait, speak, speak. Vedana uh, uh, anupas. Anupasana, anupasana yeah, so the contemplation of feeling. If the contemplation of feeling. Um, my question is, do we, I mean, I, I understand what you said when you said that contact is very difficult to detect as it happens. Yeah. So we go after the, uh, the, the feelings. Yeah. Um, I was kind of thinking, is it... <laughs> Is it also not difficult to just go after a feeling? I mean, I can understand that, you know, you contemplate feeling as it arises, 
But isn't that also difficult? Is, isn't that <laughs> my, my question is Vedana Anu Anu Pas? I was just say contemplation of con feeling. Contemplation. So is, is it going af after Vedana? Yeah. Um, as it happens, because it's difficult to go after contact. Yeah, so, so your question is, maybe state your question as a question. So let me just get this clear in my head. So um, so uh, the contemplation, which is Vedana Anupasana, yeah. is, is that called Vedana Anupasana because we go after contemplation, because contact is difficult to detect? Yeah. Um, but isn't Vedana itself difficult to detect okay. as well? Okay. Of course, everything. <laughs> All of these mental factors, you could say, are difficult to detect. But I would say that contact, because it's like an initial moment that yeah. sets off a feeling, yeah. is very difficult to detect. But as one observes one's experience, one can start to see feelings and to start to see them most clearly. And the way this occurs in, maybe most often, in the practice of intensive meditation, is that what the feeling that one starts to see most clearly is usually the painful feelings that arise in the body as one is you know, sitting over long periods. So one could pretty clearly, when the pain <laughs> arises and becomes strong, then one could see it very, very clearly. Okay. But also, as one pays attention to what is going on in the mind, one will see pleasant feelings when they arise. Thank you. Yeah, and so it's with the refinement of attention that feelings become clearer and clearer until when the mind becomes very sharp and very clear and one could just observe the succession of feelings, just like maybe sitting on the bank of a river and watching the water flowing by, one wave after another flowing by. So one is just watching feeling arise and pass, arise and pass, arise and pass. And it's about uh, just uh, coming up to nine o'clock now. I see, yeah, yeah. So uh, perhaps this is a... <laughs> Perhaps is that a good time to uh, to close things for the okay. evening. So that, okay. Um, since you've got a, a full schedule ahead of you over the next few yeah. days. Okay. So if we can express our uh, appreciation. Okay. Thank you. And my young Dhammagata Sadukarang Dadama say Sadu Sadu. Sato Anumodami